Hey everybody, how y'all doing there today? My name is Miggy. This is going to be the Figma for Education Animation Basics. Thanks for joining our webinar today. I'm also joined by Alex and Lauren. Um, so feel free to say hi to Alex and Lauren. Uh, please use the webinar chat to uh, talk with us, to ask questions. So when you go to the chat, make sure you set your chat to everyone. So then that way we can all see. And let's begin with just a quick icebreaker while we let folks continue to join the web webinar. Uh, so yes, this is a recorded webinar. I'm going to let y'all know that this is going to be recorded. Uh, folks ask that all the time. So I would like to make that as omnipresent as possible. Hey, how's it going? Um, so, you know, while we get started, I usually like to ask where folks are joining us from. So I am joining you from Rochester. Chester, New York. It's a bit cold and damp here. Normally it's snowy, but I would love to know where you are at and what's the weather like today? Let's ask that today. What is the weather like today? So Bay Area, we got uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so we got some folks dealing with snow. We got folks in Toronto, Portugal. It's freezing. Brooklyn, Colombia, New York, Brazil, Lagos. Greenville, Chicago. Oh, it's so really is great to see how many of there of you there are. As mentioned, this is going to be animation basics. Um, you know, I found this this fun little flippy animation. Uh, so we're going to be getting into some of the nitty gritty on on how to make some fun things in Figma. Uh, this is Figma for education, so we're going to have more of an education lens on things, thinking about the use cases for educators, for students, for teaching Figma, for teaching animation, and just having available tools to be well rounded and understanding design and those kind of principles. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin today. This workshop will be recorded and it will be sent out to you afterwards. So if you've registered and you're here today, you are also going to get an email from us with a link to the recorded demo. So if there's something that you might have missed that you didn't quite catch, you can review and you can learn these concepts and we can learn together. Uh, make sure you set that chat to everybody so everyone can see what you're saying not just the hosts and panelists. So there's a few of you chatting. I see Las Vegas, sunny, 42 degrees. Um, so let us know where you're coming from. So, hey, Honduras, how are you doing? We got Vancouver in the house. So set that chat to everyone so everyone can see the questions that it is you are asking. So many of you are just chatting directly to us. We love to see it, but let everybody else know you're here as well. Um, also, we would just kindly ask that you refrain from posting LinkedIn accounts, uh, from posting any links in the chat. Please do not do that. This is not the space for it. Uh, by joining this webcast, you are subscribing to Figma's Code of Conduct in some, we would like for y'all to be kind to one another. Remember, everybody here is coming from a different background, a different skill level. We are all learning together. So please be kind. Uh, if you want to see more about Figma's code of conduct, you can check it out there. And once again, this is being recorded. So I'm just going to drag this around so, you know, you can be reminded of such. All right. So a little bit about me. Let me bring down the recorded component. There we go. Ah, it's a little bit of a joke. All right. But not really. It is being recorded for real. Um, um, my name is Miggy. I'm a designer advocate for education. Those of you who may be joining and say Miguel Cardona, hmm, I've heard of that name. The In the U.S., the Secretary of Education has my name. He may be my third cousin. Nobody knows. So uh, you can be, reach me at Miggy at Figma.com. Also, be sure to email us at education at figma.com. If you have any questions regarding education verification, the education benefit with Figma, we would love to know and, and help you out with that. Uh, this right here is a little photo booth widget. So I'm just going to throw in a little, you know, hello there. Normally when we're doing this, oops, there we go. It got me mid conversation. Normally when we're doing this, when there's fewer folks on the web stream, we would invite you to join us in this document, but because there's so many many of you joining us here today, uh, what we're going to do is share with you a community file. So if you want to follow along, if you go to figma.com slash at education, you can, oh, hey, Alex, how's it going? 
It's good to see you. Um, so here, check out Figma for Education Basics. So you can go to figma.com slash education. This entire file that I'm going to be demonstrating today and walking you through can be found right here. So feel free, click on that link. You know, you can get a copy of that file. Let me show you one more time. When you go to this page, you can get a copy. When you get a copy, if you have a Figma account already, you will get a duplicate of this copy in your Figma account, and it'll include all the different pages and examples that I'm going to be covering today. Think of it as a start file. Okay. Cool. So now that we've covered that, a few other things, if you're looking for more, you know, content that I produce and in, in tutorials of Figma, you can also check out my TikTok, Professor Figma, or my Figma template profile, my community profile, figma.com slash at Miggy. All right, so a couple quick things too. Figma and FigJam are free for students and educators. It's a three-step process. You're going to sign up for Figma. You're going to verify your education status. So you come here, you get verified. It'll ask you a few questions. It's going to say, what school do you teach at? You know, what is it that you do? And then once you are set up, you can create an education team. So an education team, if I click right here, this will walk you through all of those steps on creating an education team. You want to make sure Sure that you make a team because it will give you the opportunity to collaborate with your students and use advanced features in Figma, such as audio chat, videos and prototypes, as well as creating reusable libraries. And these will be topics that we can cover at like a later time. So feel free, if you're just joining us, check it out. Uh, you can go ahead and download that file. So once again, you sign up for Figma, you verify your education account, and then you can set up your education team. When you go to create a new team, choose professional, and then make sure you just check off at the top um, that you are an educator or a student. So we're going to get started. This is Figma. For those of you who are brand new and who may not have used Figma for before, we're going to cover just a few basics. Uh, just so you can understand this interface, it could be a little bit overwhelming at first, but I want you to feel comfortable in this space. The best way to learn Figma is just to have something to do in Figma, and we're going to give you plenty to do today. So once again, up here in the top left, this is the main Figma toolbar. If I click on this main menu, I can access a bunch of functions within Figma itself. This quick actions menu is something too that I'm going to discuss in just a moment. When you can also use a lot of tools that you're going to be accessing here that we're also going to discuss shortcuts for, such as creating frames, creating shapes, using the pen tool to make vector shapes. If you're familiar with other design software, some of this will be familiar for you, especially if you are, you know, first time in Figma. And I can see that we have some folks that are brand new. So try not to feel overwhelmed. Just take a little bit at a time. I mentioned here the quick actions shortcut. Uh, I'm going to show you the quick actions shortcut because it allows you to access so many features. Like if you forget something, you can type it into quick actions. So I'm going to press, I'm on a Mac, so I'm going to press command P. But if you're on Windows, you can hit control P and it's right here. So command P or control P. It's also command forward slash or control forward slash. The reason I use command P or control P is because it's a little bit more suited for international keyboards. So now when I hit Command P, I can type in anything. So the first thing that I type in, I'm going to type in keyboard shortcuts. So keyboard shortcuts are a great way to optimize your use of Figma, to learn the lay of the land, to feel comfortable using the tool, to get faster and more optimal. So I'm going to type in keyboard shortcuts, and it's going to bring up this little menu down here at the bottom of my frame. So you don't need to be in Figma right now. You can just watch me. You can watch this recording. You can go over it later. But if you are open in Figma right now, you can type in that shortcut. So once again, I'll show you command forward slash and type in keyboard shortcuts. There you go. It's a toggle. So it'll turn on and off. And so down here, it'll cover a bunch of the essentials. And then as I type those out, let me find one. Here we go. Uh, so as I type these out, I will see them light up. So I know which shortcuts I've used and which shortcuts I haven't. This is actually how I got really good at Figma was just understanding what I could do. So even looking here in the text menu, I can see that, oh, okay. So I can bold my text. 
text. I can underline my text. Oh, I can create links of my text. I can do strike through. I could turn it into a bulleted list, right? All of these shortcuts not only increase your workflow, but also help you understand what you can do with Figma. So if I was to move over to like the shape tools, I can start to see what is the lay of the land, right? And one fun shortcut that I like to show people who typically don't know is like this join selection and smooth join selection. When I first joined Figma, I showed my manager this and he didn't even know it existed. So learning the keyboard shortcuts in Figma is going to be a great way to introduce uh, anybody else that you're showing Figma to to like learn Figma yourself. If you're working with students, share it with them. And the thing that I would like to highlight here is that everybody sees their own shortcuts. So if I was on Windows, if I was on a Chromebook, I would see the shortcuts specific to my operating system. And if I was working with folks, so I have folks here from Spain, if I click layout, whoops, uh, here we go. Let me pull that back up. Uh, if I click layout, I can choose a different keyboard layout for my shortcuts. So if I was coming from uh, Spain, I can go here and I can click Spanish and then I will get all of the Spanish shortcuts in my keyboard menu. So this is really helpful. I know a lot of folks were unaware of this feature, but we want to try to be as inclusive as possible and as accessible as possible with Figma as we develop our tools. So I'm just going to head back over. Let me go back to US QWERTY because that's me. Awesome. I want to make sure that y'all are getting this, this, this deep down information that might be kind of hard to find. A couple quick things. You may see me navigating and whizzing around this canvas. Uh, I can zoom all the way out. I can zoom all the way in. One of the great aspects of Figma is that you have this infinite canvas to drop images, to drop shapes, to create illustrations, to create prototypes, right? Figma provides you this space. It doesn't bound you down, it doesn't bind you down to just like a very specific frame and lock you in there. So to get comfortable using this space, you could either hold the space bar and drag if you have a mouse. So I hold the space bar, turns my cursor into a little hand. I could drag that around, or you could do two finger touch on iPad, on your touchpad. You can also zoom in and zoom out. There's a number of ways to do this. I'm holding down the command key while I scroll but you can also pinch on the touchpad and you can hold the commands key while scrolling or hit command plus, control plus, control minus. So knowing these two things is like half the battle, how to pan around the canvas, how to zoom in, in and out of the canvas. Those of you that are Figma pros, you already got this. So a couple other things, I'm going to refer to certain interface areas. The layers panel over here is on the left. Just above that, you notice there's a bunch of pages. So if you're looking through this file, I can click on all of these pages. Pages come in really handy when you need to differentiate the work that you're doing. When I was teaching classes at the Rochester Institute of Technology, I would teach design courses with my students. We would work together in the same file and I would have students create their own pages pages with their own names. So then that way I can go page by page and see their work whenever we were doing an activity together. So pages is going to be a fantastic way to allow and give folks their own space to work if you're working together or to section out your content. So I actually knew a teacher who had an entire Figma file as a course and every single page was a different lecture for a different week. Okay, a couple other things here. Figma is collaborative by nature. So uh, if Alex is here, Alex, how are you doing? Are you here? Hello? There, there's Alex. So Figma is collaborative in nature. So you can work in real time with people. Uh, you know, I draw a rectangle on the canvas. Lauren is here as well. Hey, Lauren, I could draw a rectangle on the canvas and now Lauren can resize it. So like Lauren can click on it, can resize it. So Figma is real time live collaboration at your working. So Alex says, let's make it a different color. Let's make it a different color. Alex can round it, the corners. So it's really fun and engaging when you work with others in the file. Granted, there's tons of you right here, right? There's about, uh, there's hundreds of you in this, this workshop today. So normally I would say if there was about 50 of us, we could be in here. Even if there was a hundred or 200 of us, we could all be in here, but there's a lot of y'all and I don't want to be exclusive to, to anybody in the chat today. So to share that, all you need to do, I can share this link. I can copy that link out um, in the share menu. I can choose who has access to it. So I could say anybody with the link, anybody with the link and password 
password so I can password protect these files or only people that I specifically invite to the file with their names can have access. So these are just some of those basics and I want y'all to feel comfortable knowing how that works. Lastly, there are a bunch of file functions up at the top here of the window. So things like seeing the version history, as long as your file is in an education team, you get unlimited version history. So you can go back all the way to uh, if a file's existed since September 2021, you can go back to September 2021 and see what students interacted in the file at that time. You can also do things like duplicate this file so I can just have a new copy of it right then and there. Everything is just stored on the cloud, instantly available. You can rename the file and you can move the file to a different project. The way that Figma works is in our, our file browser, we have projects. Think of those as your folders. So uh, one keyboard shortcut that's going to be important for us today, uh, I know it's already 15 past and we haven't really got into prototyping, but we're going to start off, is going to be Shift E. That tool is going to give us the opportunity to go between what is the design panel and the prototype panel. So we're going to be doing a lot of prototyping today. So I want to emphasize the Shift E shortcut. It's going to allow you to swap between design and prototype. Uh, also, I'm going to be creating a frame in just a moment. So frames are going to be the way that we're going to house our content. The shapes that you create, the images that you use, anything that you're putting, the way that you're going to house it all is going to be inside of frame. And once we begin animating, we're going to be dependent on those frames. So if you think about when you animate, you know, you're, you're thinking the sequencing of visuals, we're going to use those frames. There's going to be a number of presets. Once you create the frame, you can see those presets. And those presets exist for everything from an iPhone all the way to presentation slides, all the way to print documents. So we'll be talking about the frames and those presets, and these are regularly updated as new devices become available. All right, cool. So uh, let's, I'm going to scroll down here. I'm just going to show you a few quick things in Figma. So the shapes are right here, right? We have a rectangle, we have an ellipse, and we have a polygon. These are going to be important because I'm going to use these primitives as things that I'm going to animate. What's really cool about these is when you select it and you're in design mode, you have properties over here that allow you to manipulate its various properties. So I select the shape and then I can change things like the color. I could change things like the size. Um, and so you're changing the properties of these objects. So when you're animating, you're changing these properties across frames and across time. So let's do this one too. What's really cool about the polygon tool is you can use it to create all manner of different shapes. And this is what is referred to as a non-destructive operation. I'm selecting this little dot and I'm increasing the number of edges that we have here. Those properties can all also be changed over here. So being able to access that geometry and work with it is a lot of fun. Also, these tools have fun little secrets. So the uh, circle tool here has the arc. So I can actually create some very interesting kind of like pie chart graphics. I can even make it into like an activity ring. So what's great about these is that these are non-destructive features until you flatten them. Actually, Alex, who was in here, was the first person to show me how to easily flatten objects for my tutorials. So here we go. I'm going to even rotate that and I can change these values. So working with those shapes. Now I mentioned before frames, when I press the F key, I can draw out a frame. So this is a frame. This is frame 1949. You can see I have a lot of frames in this file. All you need to do is double click it and I can say frame one. I can give it a name. I could call this frame, let's say, all right, this is Lauren's frame, so I can put that name there. All I need to do to do is change that. When I grab a shape and I add it to a frame, it's going from the canvas into the frame itself, and it is now nested inside of this frame. Isn't it a nice shape, right? I can even round out those corners. There we go. Now I have that nice shape. So the first thing that you need to know is to create a frame, to add something to it, and then we can duplicate it. 
right? So I can go here and hit Command C or com and then Command V to paste it. So your typical copy paste workflow on your machine. So if you're on Windows, Control C, Control V. So Control C, Control V. And then I have another copy over here. Another way that you can copy is just to hold down the option key. So the option key on your keyboard, you'll see Control, Option, Command, or Alt, and, and control. So the alt key on Windows, you can duplicate that as well. And as, men, as Lauren mentioned, command D will also make that duplicate. So there's a number of different ways to do this. All right, so let's go into the uh, next section of what we have here. We're gonna be talking about prototypes. Once again, this is being recorded, so you will get an email and you'll be able to follow along there. Uh, so in this file, I've also included some resources. So if you're new to prototyping and you haven't quite wrapped your head around the concept, a prototype is just the testing of an idea, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a phone prototype. In, the, in today's examples, we're gonna be prototyping animation. So here, if you are looking at the community file, you can hit play and you can actually watch these videos that have been provided by Figma to help you further go into that and explore that concept. So we're going to begin by walking through what a simple interaction is. So at this point, you understand a shape, you understand what a frame is, and we're going to show you how to create relationships between those frames to uh, uh, basically communicate ideas, right? So communicate motion, so communicate how things move. So I'm going to begin here, right? So I have a start frame and I have an end frame. And what I'm going to do is create a relationship between these two. I'm going to refer to this thing as a prototype noodle. You will only see these when we are in prototyping mode. So we're going to create the relationship between those two frames, and we're going to create an interaction between those two frames. So I'm going to move over here to the right. I'm going to press the F key, the F key for frames. So up here, frame, if you need to know the shortcut, it's going to be right next to it. So frame, I'm going to draw out that frame. And now it doesn't really matter what size the frame is because I'm going to come over here to the right with my design panel. I'm going to click on that drop down and I'm going to search for the frame that I want to uh, uh, make my design in. So I'm going to choose an iPhone 14 to start. It's really helpful to use the presets. So then that way you have an appropriate sense of scale and how big things or how small things need to be because it's easy to lose track of it when you're zoomed in or zoom out. You're like, whoa, how big is this really? Use those presets and it'll help you get a sense of what that scale really is. So here we go. I've created a frame and I'm going to use the shortcut that Lauren shared, a command D. There we go. I have now two frames. Thanks, Lauren. I almost forgot about that one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a start and an end. So I'm going to type start and I'm going to type in end. And it's important that you name your frames here because this will help you when you begin uh, working through your process. So either numbering them or working through them in a way, and I can show you a trick on how to do that in just a moment. So I'm going to create a very simple shape here. I'm going to draw a rectangle. I'm going to draw a rectangle. Now you'll notice as I move it around within this frame, the frame has kind of snapping, allowing me to place it in the center to see exactly where I want it to go. So here we go. It is now snapped into the center. And I'm going to click on this next frame over here. I'm going to hit paste there and I'm going to have a copy of it right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just make this larger. Notice I'm making, if I was just to make this larger from the top, it just comes up from the top. But if I hold down one of my modifier keys, so if I hold down the option key or the alt key on Windows, once again, that's the option key or the alt key on Windows, I can stretch this out from the center, which makes it a lot easier, right? I don't have to move this up and this down. I can just hold down the option key and they both grow out from the center and they grow out from the center there. Uh, there we go. Let me recenter that. So now let's say I'm going to change this. So this is red and this is going to be blue. So I'm going to create this to be a prototype. So let's select this first frame. 
I'm going to go over here, press prototype. This can also be done with the toggle shift E. Let me go ahead and grab that from up here because I've mentioned this before, shift E. That is going to allow you to toggle between these two because we're going to go between our design panel and our prototype panel a lot. Using that toggle is going to save you time. I don't bother with memorizing all of the keyboard shortcuts. I just think about the keyboard shortcuts that I'm going to need for my work session. So if I'm about to be prototyping a lot, you know, then I will remind myself that shift E is that toggle and it'll save me some time. So shift E, I'm now in prototype mode. And when I'm in prototype mode, when you click on any object or when you click on a frame, you will see that it behaves just a little bit differently. The first thing that you will notice when I select this shape is there's this little plus icon that shows up to the right of it. What that's going to do is going to give me the ability to create my prototyping noodle and to choose how an interaction is going to take place. And you may be asking yourself, well, what does this have to do with animation? And the thing is, is you need an event to trigger an animation, or you need an event to have the animation occur between these frames. So what I'm going to do, um, I would like to, to please ask folks to refrain from adding uh, additional links to our chat. So uh, I see that people are asking that if you continue to do so, um, you will be removed. Um, so here, I'm going to take this and I'm going to drag this over to this next frame. So what I've done is I've created this interaction noodle, and then I get these details that pop up. So over here in this file, I kind of explain what some of these details are. Um, and we're going to think of the interaction type. We're then going to have an event that takes place. So is it on tap? Is it on drag? Is it while hovering? So you want to think of these events as if you're interacting with a phone object or you're interacting with an app on your computer. What are you doing? What is the thing that you're doing? And then what's going to happen as a result? So when we're inter animating, we still need to treat trigger the series of animation. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then we need to think about where that's going. So the interaction, the behavior, and then the destination. So here, now that I click on that noodle, I get these interaction details. So here, I'm basically going to say on tap, right? So on tap, it's going to navigate to. The navigate to basically asks it to go to another frame. Then here, end. So the name of that frame matters because if you're selecting it from this dropdown and you have like 20 frames named frame one, frame two, frame three, you're going to get lost pretty quickly. So be sure that you have a good naming convention. And it's a good opportunity to discuss organization with your students or with your classmates or with your teammates. So here it's going to go to end. And then right here, this is how we're going to choose how this goes from point A to point B. First, let's begin with instant, just so we can see how this works. I'm also going to select this red one and then have it go back. So I'm going to say on tap, it's going to navigate to the start. And that also is going to be instant. So we just have these two arrows going back and forward. And you'll notice this little playhead up here. That is the flow. So any series of frames that we have is a flow. So think of your animation as being a flow. So I can rename this and I'm just going to say super, super basic. Uh, and I'm going to hit the play button. So what we have here, and you'll notice there's already a device that, that has been ascribed for this. So here uh, in my, my prototype settings, we will be able to control like what is the device, right? So here now, all that's happening and there's no animation, right? It's just going from frame one to frame two, right? Nothing special is happening here. Um, but we're beginning to understand what's going to take place, right? What's going to transpire? We are going to have this square go to this larger rectangle. And basically what we're doing is we're changing its properties. So we're going to make it taller. We're going to change its height. And we're also going to change another property, its color. So everything that we've modified here for this rectangle. So the fill color and the height. Um, these heights are abysmal. But what I want to do is I just want to expand and I want to, to bring this down. So what we're going to do 
is we're going to go back into that prototype mode. I'm going to select both of those noodles, right? So I'm going to select them. And then here, when I on tap and I navigate to, I'm going to choose smart animate. And we're going to talk all about smart animate. And I got a bunch of examples to show you in just a moment. So we're going to choose smart animate. And we're going to set an ease in and ease out. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell it to animate from this point A to this point B. And then we're going to tell it how to animate and the motion. And by the way, we're going to be talking about those motions in a, just a little bit. So here we go. So when we click on this, it's going to go to that first one. And then when we click on it, it's going to go back. So let's hit that play button. And when I click and I go back, when I click and then I go back, right? So what's happening is that it's is looking at the properties of the two and it's tweening, right? It's tweening between those. And I can change the amount of time that takes place between those as well. So here, if I go, let's say 150 milliseconds, right? It's gonna go much faster. Now, if I select those and I say, instead, um, let's do 600 milliseconds, right? It's gonna be much slower. So understanding these main concepts is gonna get you very far. All right, any, any questions on that, please? Any questions, any questions? I see that there's a lot going on in the chat. Um, Anybody, can you show again how to connect the red block box into blue box? Absolutely. So let's say I, I have these noodles. Watch, if I move this frame, you get a much better sense of how these noodles are going, right? I can select those. I can delete them. So in the prototype mode, right? Press shift E to switch between them. I select that first one and you'll get these little dots that hover up. So any object that you have, I'm going to drag this over and have that go to the second frame. It'll snap once it hits that frame. And you'll see the interaction details for that arrow. Next, I can select this one and drag that going back. So what these are doing is that this one is going to this next frame and this one is going back to the pre previous frame. So I, I see that you're asking if there's a shortcut to connect noodles. Um, what you can do is you can actually, you, you can do various things. Like I can move these noodles uh, to go somewhere else, right? There's, there's certain ways to, to kind of shortcut with them. Um, but primarily you're going to be uh, modifying them here because you need to be more specific about where it's going, right? It requires your intent and understanding your intent. So that's going to be here. So maybe the shortcut can be just having your interaction details open and going to that particular point. Okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, Smart Animate. So we've already began to talk through that concept. So here, once again, I have another resource for understanding the concepts of Smart Animate to kind of fill in the gaps of things that we're unable to cover today. Remember, once again, that this is a little YouTube video. You can watch it. It's in the file that we shared at the beginning of the uh, session. So basically, this is a review of what we already have done, where you have an object and you're beginning to modify its properties. So I'm going to hover over to those examples. I'm going to hit play, and then I'm going to walk you through how you can do a little bit more with that. So let's go to my first frame. So someone asked me, how did I put a YouTube in Figma? I'll show you that in just a moment. So here we have these, these animations taking place, right? And these are going from frame to frame. And they're looking at the properties of each. And they're intelligently using um, those properties to communicate you know, concept. So this one almost looks like a 3D object, right? There's nothing in here but circles, right? Just circles colored a particular way. 
Um, bu- 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 can you mass apply noodles? Yes, you can mass apply noodles. Uh, there are some restrictions with how you do that. So here we go. These are some other examples of how to create loaders. And you'll notice that these animations are going to continue to move forward without the intervention of myself, right? So I'm able to see how this is going from frame to frame. Maybe it might be a click that begins it, but you can use a different type of event to set off a chain reaction of frames to play one after the next. So even here, um, so I see Caroline, uh, the file has already been been shared. You can download the file from figma.com slash education. Uh, I believe that we just threw a link in the chat. Thank you. Um, so all of these examples are here that you can use. So these can be used for micro interactions. Um, these can be used in a number of different ways. And the thing that I want you to see is that this is nothing more than a series of frames and understanding this concept using a different type of event and using those shapes in a way to uh, better explain these concepts. So I'm gonna head back here to Smart Animate and we're gonna dig into a little bit more about how to be successful when creating these animations that are frame-based. Uh, all right, cool. Real quick, how to put a YouTube video in Figma. I'm actually going to open up Fig Jam. So Fig Jam is our, our whiteboarding tool, right? You could drop in stickies, you know, you could drop in, you know, like heart-shaped eyes and stuff. So this is a collaborative tool. Um, in Fig Jam, Fig Jam is really unique in that if you have a YouTube video, so like, let's say I'm here in Figma and I want to view this YouTube video, I can copy that video link and I can paste it into Fig Jam. So here in Fig Jam, I get this fun little player and I can actually hijack Fig Jam. I can cut that out and then paste it right into Figma. So that's 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 kind of how I'm doing it right there. All right. So inserting smart animate into a Fig Jam presentation, you can make it an animated GIF. Um, however, that is outside of the bounds of this presentation today. All right. So we're going to be talking about smart animate. So what about inserting videos into Figma? Um, you can check out, uh, it's outside of the scope of today, but you can check out figma.com slash at Figma. And there is a great videos in prototyping file. Uh, I actually worked on this. That gives you a full breakdown on how to insert video into your Figma prototypes. If you have an education team, um, files on the education team will allow you to uh, add those. Okay, cool. So we're going to get back to Smart Animate. And you can see here that I have four frames. The first thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to create an ellipse, right? And I'm going to show you some secrets on how to be more intentional with your animations and how to be more successful with Smart Animate. So here I've created this ellipse. Now, only certain properties can be animated with Smart Animate. You can't animate strokes or very complex vector shapes. You can animate things like position, color, scale, um, and 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 it's going to and and rotation as well. That was the word I was looking for, rotation. So you can animate position, size, scale, color, rotation, and using those properties, you can animate in here. So the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to create a circle. I'm going to go over to the design panel. I think I have my snap settings. Let me turn snap to pixel grid on. Once again, that's command P, and then I type in SNAP, and then it allows me to snap to pixel grid. More on the quick actions menu in the first page. So let me make sure that snap is on. So this way, when I'm when I'm making a circle, I get nice, even pixels, right? No more 0.569, right? Now I get nice, even pixels. So now that I've created this circle, uh, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to make it into a component, right? What a component is, is kind of like a predefined reusable element in Figma. Uh, I'm going to change the name of this component and I'm going to call this, you know, animating circle. Names matter, but I don't really know what's name it at the moment. So 
a component is is something that is reused, right? It's at the core of, of using things and reusing things in Figma. If I was to hit Command D or Control D and, and duplicate this, right? And if I was to create a bunch of them, I'm holding down the, the Option key here. When I change the original, the others follow suit. Even if I were to scale this one and if I were to change that color, as long as it's a component, right? They are all the same. They're all instances of them. They just may have an override that then can also be re-overridden, right? So what I want is I want to make my core asset you know, this is the thing that I'm going to animate across these frames. You know, I want to make sure that it's consistent across those frames. So creating things as components, let's make one more component. So let's make just like a rectangle. Uh, I'm going to come up here. The shortcut key is going to be option command K or control alt K. Um, so by hovering over the component button, you will see the name. If you don't see it, it's because you haven't selected anything. So select that shape, come up here, choose the create component, and then you will have this component that is now available for reuse. And let me go here. I'm just going to say animating, you know, rectangle. Um, bu -bu 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 -tangle. So these are just like my assets, right? And these assets are going to be used on these frames. So if I hold down the option key, I'm going to drag this to frame one, right? And then I'm gonna drag another copy over here to frame two. I'm gonna drag another copy to frame three. I'm gonna drag another copy to frame four. And I'll show you that one more time. Let's cover that whole thing one more time. These are our assets, right? They're gonna persist across these frames here. And I'm gonna change their properties. So here I'm just gonna duplicate this circle. So if I imagine this circle being a bouncing ball, right? What I can do is I can use this as a way to animate that bouncing ball. Oops, let me see if I have any extra, I think there's just an extra thing in there. There we go. So I'm gonna have this, this bouncing ball. Now, to change, once again, just find all the shortcuts, Command P, and then type in keyboard shortcuts and you'll get them all there. You can also find it. There should be like a little question mark. Or if you click up here, you go into the help and account, you can find the keyboard shortcuts there. So what I can do here is I'm going to create this, this animation. I'm going to tween between these. Now, the thing that I want to highlight here, when I look at these frames, the layers panel over here becomes very important, right? It's really important for you to know the layering of your objects and the naming of your objects. So the reason that I made this into a component was that I've named it, right? Now that I've named it and that I've made it an asset, right? Figma is well aware of it. And by going into prototype mode, when I hover over this, right, and this is something, you know, pay close attention to, when I hover over this, I can see that Figma recognizes that it's the persistent object across those frames. I need Figma to know that it's the same object across those frames. Otherwise, it won't animate properly. Like if in this frame, I were to name this something else, if I was just to say, you know, I'm just going to call it Miggy, right? That's my Miggy frame. Now, when I hover over, right, Figma no longer recognizes that circle on that last frame as being something that this frame is going to animate to anymore, right? So it's important that you are consistent with your naming and your layer structure. And I'll show you the layer structure aspect with the next one when I drop in something in. So the difference between a component and an asset, a component is a very specific thing in Figma, right? So uh, a component is a type of object in Figma. An asset is more of an abstract concept that I'm saying that's just something that you're going to use. So asset, abstract concept that I'm using to relate a component to you. So component is uh, 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 
you know, a number of things. So a component could be anything as, as a shape, or you could have a component that looks as complex as an Instagram card that contains text and shapes and images and photos, right? So this is a singular component. So your component is going to think of it as your basic unit for animation, right? This is the thing that I'm moving around on my stage that I'm intentional about moving it around. Okay, cool. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to make sure that this last frame has the correct name. So now that I'm in prototyping mode, I have the instances, right? These are all just copies of this main component here. You can tell the main component because it has these four diamonds and these instances just have one big empty diamond, right? So the main component has these four diamonds and the instances just have these little ones here. So what I'm going to do is in prototyping mode, I'm going to have these frames go automatically from the first frame to the second frame to the third frame. So here I can select this point and drag from the first one to the second one. Same thing here from the second one to the third one, from the third one to the fourth one, and I can have the fourth one go all the way back to the first one. Now I've created a bunch of interactions here. I didn't pay close attention to the details. And that's because I'm going to change the details at the same time. So y'all were asking about shortcuts with prototyping earlier. The thing that I can do is I can batch edit these noodles. Batch edit these noodles. I like that. So here I'm going to select each noodle while press holding down the shift key. So I'm going to select this one. Then I'm going to hold down the shift key, press that one. I'm going to select that one and this one. And this is going to let me edit all of these at the same time. So anything that I can easily change that is the same across them. So I can look at my interaction details. I can see this on click interaction. Now, I don't want to click through every frame. I want it to automatically progress, just like those examples that I showed you earlier of the Pac-Man. And I want the animation to progress of its, of its own doing, right? So I'm going to choose this amazing, this wonderful, this event down here called after delay, right? So I'm going to leave that up on screen. So hopefully you can see that after delay can only be set on the frame itself, right? I'm going to say that one more time for y'all in the back. After delay can only be set on the frame itself. So when I choose after delay, what it's asking me for is how long should I wait on this frame before I move to the next frame. So I'm on this frame for, was it one millisecond, 50 milliseconds, you know, one whole second. How long am I paused on this frame for before I move on to the next one? So I'm going to choose, I'm going to type in zero, but the thing is, is Figma doesn't recognize zero. So it's going to be one millisecond. It has to have at least some point of time that it exists on this frame. So I'm going to choose one millisecond and that's going to be an instant. So basically I'm saying it's on this frame for one millisecond, then it's going to move on to the next one. And here too, I can choose the type of ease, right? So here I'm actually going to use one of these fun presets that I have down here. So these are all spring presets. They're kind of like bouncier in the way that they animate. And I'm just going to use this opportunity to showcase them to you. So here I can choose gentle. So I'm going to have like a little gentle spring and I can preview that by hovering over this panel right here. I can also change that to quick. I could change it to bouncy. So let's have this ball go from point A to point B with a bouncy spring, right? We need to determine what type of movement we want to use. And once again, I have an entire page dedicated to certain types of movements. Uh, and hopefully we will, we will be able to get to that. Uh, today, we're probably going to extend off into uh, 15 past the hour. So, you know, we're going to go just beyond 1, 1, uh, 1 p.m. my time. It's going to be different for you all. Some of you, it's probably pretty late. So I apologize. But we're going to extend this for the sake of the recording. So here, when I hover, I can see that that bouncy interaction. 
Um, right now it's set to 800 milliseconds. This is the duration of the animation that's going to take place between these frames, right? It's going from the bottom and it's going up. So let's do that. So once again, all of these noodles have been selected. So I'm animating all of the properties at the same time. You may notice up here that it says mixed and that mixed value is basically each one is going to a different frame. So I don't want to bother with that. I want to leave that there. So I'm going to close that out. And here I'm going to hit play. And we're going to see how this works, right? And basically this is what's happening is that the ball is going from the top to the bottom, to the top, to the bottom, right? I'll, I'll, I'll hold that there for you for just a little bit, but you can preview this and you can see. Now I can actually keep this open and I can modify by, by clicking all of these, uh, these arrows here. And I can change that from being bouncy to let's say quick, right? And now I can go and, and, and go there. Oh, let me find it. Oh, wrong one. Here we go. And I can see that change. So I can actually keep this, this window open, right? I can move this over here, you know, while I'm editing um, over here. Let me move that up a little bit. There we go. So, and let me even change that zoom level. I'm going to press the Z key right there. So there we go. Let me move this window over. And hopefully y'all can see that. There we go. Let me move this up. Okay, so if I were to make any changes here, like let's say gentle, you can see that update in my other window. Uh, and somebody asked me, how did I make that loop? Uh, basically by having the last frame go back to the first frame. So after delay is gonna give you that ability to go between them. So now let's change another property. So let's change this frame. I'm going to come over here to the right in the design panel. I'm going to choose that color and I'm going to make that red. And now we're going to see in that animation updating there in my right window, the preview window, that when it goes to that frame, it's animating to red. And now I can come down here and let's say this one, you know, I want to make it blue. So now when it reaches that one red frame, it comes down to blue. And then let's say that last frame, let's say I don't you know, want to change the color. I want to reduce its size. Okay, so as I'm making those changes, I'm able to see this update live. Yes, I love it. Y'all are digging this. This is great. Okay, cool. So all of these updates can be made. Now you can change other properties in here as well. I can select this frame four. And by the way, when I was working with my students, each student was in their own page. I can just go page by page and preview their animations. I didn't need to download anything. I didn't even need to ask them for the link. We we're already in the same file. And as they're making changes, I can watch them change. So even Lauren, Lauren, would you change that first frame? Um, change the, select the frame itself. Can you select the frame itself and change the background color of the frame to blue? There you go. So now we can see that when it goes back to that first frame, it's now blue. So Lauren and I are collectively working on this prototype together, right? So imagine doing this any other way. It's like brand new. Um, so we're able to like collectively work and articulate the, the changes that we're making and how we're working on this. So even if I wanted to add in like uh, this rectangle, Right. And I'm using these abstract shapes as a starting point. Eventually, you know, you can throw in um, an interface, you can throw in a, a component. Um, and I'll show you that in, in just a moment um, that is more indicative of uh, like a phone, a mobile phone layout, or like a website. But these are the foundations, these are the basics of the animation that helps you understand what you can do. So I'm going to copy this rectangle, I'm going to paste it here in my first frame. And you can see it show up, right? It shows up. And because the, rect the rectangle doesn't exist in other frames, Figma doesn't know what to do. So it's going to phase it out. It's going to fade it out. It's going to be like, oh, I'm, I don't know what to do. It's gone. But 
once I copy that rectangle and I paste another instance here, it now knows what to do. It's like, oh, okay, right? We have a rectangle in a circle. And in this frame, we have a rectangle in a circle. And Figma now understands that bit of instruction. So it knows between those two frames to move the rectangle down. So I can, you know, make the rectangle larger and I can move it all the way down. And we can see, so I can copy the rectangle. I can paste it into frame three and you'll now see it persist. The rectangle now has its own little story in the mix here, all right? I can move it up. So now the rectangle's there, it goes down, moves up and uh, let's have the rectangle, you know, finish out its story in frame four, you know, it gets, it's going small and uh, it's now green. Oh, not, not green, let's make it green. I didn't select it right. Huh, why is it not going green? There we go, okay. I just didn't select the shape properly. And there it is. So now what it's doing, it's animating between. And the thing that I want you to take away from that is that if an object doesn't exist and Figma doesn't understand it, right? So like, let's say here, animating circle doesn't have the right name, right? I'm just gonna call it, you know, Jenny, right? So that one frame is not gonna animate correctly. It's just gonna fade in and fade out. So hopefully y'all see that. I know there's a lot going on. Let me let me delete the rectangles for a moment. I'm just gonna like delete them for a moment. And you can see that when Figma doesn't know its name and its position properly, all it does is it fades it. It doesn't connect that animation in a way that's 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 meaningful. So to fix that, I just have to make sure that the naming convention is consistent. So anim animating animate and let's just copy and paste the name it's hard to run a live stream and like be able to spell correctly there we go so now you can see that it's it's coming back now what's really cool about this is like let's say uh here we go i'm gonna take i'm gonna take lauren's uh, uh avatar here and and i'm gonna paste lauren's avatar you know in the uh in the frame and uh let's uh you know, I'm going to select all of these shapes. I'm going to right click and I'm going to reset their changes. So once I change the, uh, the, the, the fill property, I could change it to an image, you know, then you're moving an image around the, uh, around the page. Exactly. David, we got, we got dancing Lauren. So if the delay is longer than one millisecond, that is a fantastic question. Let's do that right now. So if I go into my prototyping panel and I select that first frame and I, and I choose the interaction details, and if it's larger than one millisecond, that means it's gonna pause and hold on that frame for the time being. So if I change that to let's say 1000 milliseconds, we're then gonna feel that pause. So we are now paused on that frame for one whole second before it continues. So that helps you change the pacing. So, all right, Lauren, I'll, I'll make that. I'll just make it a bouncing Miggy one second. Here we go. I'm going to change. So I'm just going to copy. There we go. Time reminder. Okay, cool. We got, we're, we're down on time a little bit. Um, I have a, a few more things to cover really quickly. I'm going to hop over to interactive components. This is something, unfortunately, we don't we don't have a ton of time to cover. But basically, the the limitation with those frames is that everything on a frame has to animate at the same time. So with interactive components, let's show you what is possible. So this is actually the question. So we have uh, Emanuela asked the question, how can you have two types of animations on the same frame, right? So right here, imagine a game of, of interactive game of tic-tac-toe, right? So let me close those all out. So this is made in Figma using the concept interactive components. And this exists on one frame, right? This too, this is an animation that exists on one frame. Uh, so I know a person just asked, I think Caroline asked, um, 
we've been sharing the the file so you can you can get access to the community file and duplicate it. So this is allowing multiple uh, uh, concurrent animations going on at the same time. Uh, here's another example where this whole animation is actually made up of a bunch of smaller ones. It might come through as a bit choppy. I don't know how Zoom is going to handle my, my animation. But basically what's taking place here is that there's a bunch of smaller animations. They're like encapsulated animations for that frame. Or if you think about making like a little like hard icon micro interaction, right? Um, being on this one frame, interactive components gives you that ability to encapsulate. Yes, exactly. There are pre-comps in After Effects. That is a fantastic example. So if anybody out there is familiar with After Effects, or if you ever used Flash before, they're like movie clips in Flash. So even right here, the flippy example, if I press the F key and I copy a flippy and I put it on here, you know, when I hit play and I select that frame, you know, now flippy has a fun little little encapsulated animation. So I'm going to show you how that works. And uh, once again, there's a number of different resources in the community file that we shared at the beginning. We'll, we'll share that again um, on interactive components. This here is a playground file. You can click on these. I also have a, a little uh, kind of TikTok style tutorial on how to use hand-drawn uh, frames when making that type of animation. Let me pause that. So the way that interactive components works, and, and I'll walk you through it here. Okay, so one, create your frame, right? Two, you know, draw your object, right? Um, then hit Command D, duplicate it, have your other frame that does something else. And let's extend that. So I, uh, I actually have a new YouTube channel. It's at design professor. So if you go to youtube.com slash at design professor, but also I make tons of videos for Figma's YouTube. So here we have these two frames, right? And we want to create an animation between them. So I have those two frames and uh, let's say that this first frame goes to the next one. We have the after delay, right? And then we have this frame. And uh, it also now goes back, right? So we have another after delay. Now I can select those frames and I can come up here and I can create a component set. When I create a component set, you'll see these dotted lines go around it. Now this has been captured and I can now reuse this in my frame. So let me give this a name. I'm going to call this dot. So if I create a frame to play this, I can go to design. Let's set an iPhone 14. Ooh, it's big. Um, and I can copy this. Let's say, let me just copy that. And I'm going to paste it here. All I need is just one of them. And uh, let me teach you another shortcut tool, the scale key. If you look up here, you can see scale. It's also the K key. I can select this object and I can scale this down. I'll show you that one more time. The scale key is, if I don't use a scale key, I'm resizing the frame. If I press K, or if I look up here, you'll see it under the move tool K. Uh, it allows me to scale something. So let me, let me, throw in a few of those here. So all of these little animations are on this frame. I can select that frame and uh, with it selected, I'm gonna press play. And we can see that they're all gonna, they're gonna animate. Um, I think, oh, when I click, they go back. So I'll show you again how I copied the frame. So this is the actual frame that I'm gonna play. Uh, when I go into prototyping mode, uh, make sure it has a start point and I will call this, uh, I will give this a, a little example name. So uh, play this now. I'm terrible at naming. Um, but all I need to do is I can copy either frame. Um, and let's say I want this to be invisible, right? You see how they have those white backgrounds. I don't want the white background. I'm going to go to design. I'm going to remove the background. I'm going to copy the first one and I'm gonna paste it in this frame here. I'm gonna press the K key. I'm gonna scale it down. Now, let's say too, I wanna to copy that second one. I can copy the second one. I can paste it. 
I can scale that down, right? And I think there's a few others in there. Let me just make sure I don't have any extras that don't need to be there. I'm just gonna select them. If you ever need to find like hidden things, press shift O and then that'll let you like find anything that's hidden. Shift O, or if you're familiar with Illustrator, it's command Y, they both do the same thing. It's outline mode and allows you to see any hidden extra objects that you don't want to be on your frame. So here we go, I have a number of these. And when I select frame nine, I can hit play. And uh, here we go. So now I have multiple concurrent animations happening on my same frame. So I have the kind of like encapsulated, the housed animation. So if you think about these up here, um, these are using rotation. You can see that this is uh, uh, going at a rate. Let's see what that rate is. So is this locked? Uh, let me just make sure. Okay, there we go. So when I select it, you can see after delay, this is 1800 milliseconds before it goes from there down and then oops, from down back up. So these are like looping. So I have two different hands and they're just going at different speeds. Or for this example, this example is a little bit more intricate. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure. So on that first one, you know, we're hovering and then it goes into this option where if I click on this one, it'll go in that direction. And I click on this one, it'll go in that direction. And what it's doing is it's using a custom animation to get that nice little kind of like bouncy interaction between them. And so what I'm doing here is I have this square and by pasting, you know, oops, let me copy the square and I paste it into this frame by pasting those um, I can even change the state that it's in. So I can click this in my design panel. I could see start, choose, circle reset, cross reset. Like I have these different states. Um, and when I hit play on that frame, there we go. Okay, same thing here. You know, the heart is just a sequence of frames that's encapsulated as a component set. Um, I'll show you one more and then we're going to uh, begin to, to wrap this up. I have one more thing to talk about with the tweens um, and then we're going to wrap up. So I'm going to draw out another little frame. And uh, this one is going to be a rectangle. I'm going to make the rectangle be full size in the first frame. And let's have it be red. I'm gonna hit Command D to duplicate that frame. And here our rectangle is gonna be much smaller and let's say blue. So we have those two frames. So I'll say, you know, uh, rect, or I'll say square start. So square start and rename this to square end. I'm gonna prototype it. I'm gonna select the frame. I'm gonna have it go to the end. I'm gonna choose after delay going to have it be one millisecond. And uh, let's have the, the, the gentle, the, or no, you know what? Let's use Smart Animate and I'm going to use a custom Bezier, right? So the custom Bezier allows me to draw a curve and I'm going to show you all my favorite one. This is the one that works 90% of the time for UX animation, right? So I'm going to go one, zero, which is basically just the coordinates of this dot, right? It's like, where's this dot going? So I'm going to choose one comma zero, right? And then the second two are the coordinates of this dot right here, right? And I normally go one, zero, point two, one, or actually let's do 1.8. Oops. One, or no, sorry. One, zero, or point eight zero point eight zero point two one right numbers wild okay so that'll give you this nice s curve that's my favorite curve to use right i love to use it on everything that's the miggy curve so here uh, i'm gonna have the same thing go back right and it's gonna keep that it's gonna remember that those were the values that i typed in so that's great it remembers that now I'm going to select those two frames. I made the animation. I'm comfortable with it. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to create a component set. So that now keeps that. And let's give that a name. Let's call this, um, you know, square. One other thing that I recognized 
here I want to select this first one. And instead of after delay, I'm going to choose while hovering. I'm going to do a fun interactive experience. I'm going to make an NFT, right? So while hovering, I'm going to change to, and then this one is going to be uh, going back. It's going to be after delay. And we're going to wait there for, let's say, 1,000 milliseconds, right? And I'll show you what I'm about to do. So I'm going to draw out a big frame. And I'm going to copy this first one into the frame. And now I'm going to hit Command-D, right? I'm going to make a duplicate. And I'm going to hold down the, the Option key and just drag that over. I'm going to make a whole grid of these, right? And let's select all of those. And then I'm going to drag these down. I'm holding down the option key. Then I can hit command D, command D, command D, command D, right? Let's make our frame a little bit bigger. I'm making an interactive experience here, folks. So now if you'll remember on hover, oh, here we go. I have to zoom it out, but uh, the zoom kind of ruined some of the lines. But now on hover, I can create a fun experience. Beep, beep, beep. Okay, cool. Last thing, I got a few slides here. So talking about tweens and what those dots mean, um, basically you can have linear motion. Linear motion is just good for something is just rotating and infinitum. You want to think of something going from off screen to off screen that's moving at a constant speed. That's the only time you ever want to apply linear motion when something is going from off screen to off screen. Let's also talk about an ease in. If you have an object that's starting from a stopped position and slowly gaining speed, that's when you want to use an ease in. So if you have something that's stopped on your frame and it's going to move off screen, it's gaining a lot of speed, ease in is the one that you're likely going to do. That's what the curve looks like in Figma, or if you're using um, a value tweening on After Effects. I saw we have some After Effects folks, not motion uh, easing, but but value easing. So here an ease out is deacceleration. It's starting like off screen and it's coming on screen. So basically it's starting at its full velocity. Imagine an object that's starting already at 60 miles per hour, beginning to slow down and come to a stop. That's an ease out. So an ease in out, I call this the goat ease, right? It's the greatest of all time. Most things in real life move this way where they stop and then they slowly gain momentum, then they slow down and come to a stop. So if you're working with most things in UX, you are creating an ease in out where it's accelerating, it speeds up, and then it slows down. An ease back is when you pull those curves just a little bit out, it gives you just a little bit of a bounce, right? It goes beyond its point, it comes back. It's a bit of exaggeration and helps communicate the object uh, in its motion, right? So when you are animating, you know, think about what it is you're trying to communicate, right? Where is your object going? How far does it have to travel? What is its perceived weight and mass? These are the things that affect how long the transition is going to take. Typically, a UX animation, you know, your transitions are going to be between 250 milliseconds to 400 milliseconds. Anything longer is going to feel like it's lurching. So if it's a bigger, heavier object, then it's going to move slower. So think about the perceived a, a, a mass of the object that you're animating. Um, and then thinking about how fast should it move relative to its size and what is its relationship to other objects? Just some thoughts to think about that. So uh, prototype early and often, I know some of you are talking about wireframes. Oftentimes I like to have motion studies. I like to have animated studies that really express how something might move. Remember, once again, this is just thinking through basics, thinking through primitives. It's a great way to explain this concept and dig deep and have have students and even yourself just to explore how things may move. Um, and with that, if there are any questions, Lauren, are there any questions that we have? Yeah, there's there's a, some, some in the questions file if you want to go over them. Oh, cool. Brilliant. All right, so uh, how can you make a picture carousel? That's going to be a, a whole nother, that's a whole nother workshop, but it is completely doable within Figma. Um, how can we export animations? So right now you can't export animations from Figma per se, but what I do is like a screen recording. So I hit command shift five on a Mac, and then it brings up this little window that allows me to record my screen recording. There's a bunch of screen recording software out there. So I actually use this for a lot out of my animations. I will even screen record things from Figma and then bring it into After Effects. One cheat code that I use is I will put a 
green background on anything that I'm screen recording if I need to composite it back into After Effects. Um, so with so many wireframes, how can we organize the noodles? You will start to see how noodles kind of present themselves as you organize. What I would recommend is that you don't create huge, huge, huge prototypes, create smaller flows. So break up your prototype into smaller chunks for communication, right? You have to think, what is it that you're trying to communicate? What is the purpose? Having two big of a prototype or having too big of an animation might be too much. It's kind of like outside of the scope. So really think about breaking it down into those smaller flows. If we look back to these examples, each of these flows exists here on the left. So every starting point that you have in a page can be viewed within the same prototype. Conversely, you can also tuck that away if you just want to keep that um, the only thing that you're showing. These prototypes, you can actually share with people and you can watch them as they're using it. So Lauren, I don't know if you're in this file, if you want to click on something, if you want to go to a different prototype, I can see you uh, as you're working through this. So Lauren, are you in here? Yeah, it's one sec. I'm on a different prototype. Sorry. Oh, okay. No worries. So here, let me, let me follow you. So now I'm following you. Uh, if you click on that, Oh, oh, you're in here a couple times. There we go. All right, cool. So now I'm watching Lauren in her prototype. So imagine you want to share this with a student. They can send you a link and you can watch them interact with it, right? Like I'm watching Lauren. Look at my hands are up here and you see it's all animating because like Lauren's, I can even see her cursor. So these are just unique ways to kind of use the prototyping. This is meant for, you know, like watching how people test your ideas uh, and sharing that with others, right? So just remember, you know, what is the purpose of what it is you're doing and what are you trying to uh, get out of it there? Um, let me go back to the questions. Do, 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 do. Uh, why auto layout is important. So auto layout is important because it allows you to move quicker. Uh, if you were to look at the, um, there's a little object that I have right here. So auto layout is important for this because as I add text, right, it expands and makes the object more uh, reactive. Um, so we will cover that in a later workshop. I'm actually thinking about for the next workshop that we do a deep dive into auto layout. So go to figma.com slash events um, and look for a future Figma for Education workshop where we will cover that. Um, so is there a standard sound for animations that is within the user's mental model? Yeah, I would say typically between about uh, 250 milliseconds to 400 milliseconds. As I mentioned before, you need to think about the object itself, the size of the object. That's going to determine that motion. What I usually recommend doing is actually creating a number of iterations. So that's something that I didn't cover here. Let me walk you through how to iterate on an animation. So here, if I have these two animations, I can select them, hold down the option key and duplicate them. And I now have a new iteration. If I want to create another start frame, I can right click and add a starting point. So you can iterate on your concept without destroying the previous one. So if I were to create another animation with this, um, I can easily go in here and then I have a, a new version that I can explore with different timing. So iterating is going to be key in helping to identify what is going to work best for your users. Ultimately, there's not going to be anything that is like 100%, but the answer is always test it and put it in front of folks. Um, so I saw a question, how can we integrate nice animation Figma to pass on developer for build development. Um, so here, when you're working, if I were to go into the inspect panel, I can see some of the properties here. These properties are going to be uh, uh, demonstrated um, for the uh, uh the the in the developer uh, as they're working. So when you go into like inspect mode, um, you can surface those properties. However, it is always going to be, you know, watching the interaction and explaining your intent. I would say that documentation is the best way for you to go. So be mindful and intentional about the type of ease um, that you're using, um, the type of easing curve. Many of these are going to be standard. So when you're thinking about ease in out and, and the types of interactions that you're working with, if I had a more custom one here, uh, let's say like I had a custom Bezier. Um, if I go into inspect, uh, let me go here, prototype. 
and let's uh, let's inspect that. Uh, I will get the uh, the easing values. I'm not getting it to come up right now, but um, it's there. Trust me. Um, cool. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you found this helpful. Uh, I'll do one last thing. I see somebody asking about the text wrap feature. Yes, there's a text wrap feature when you type in text. Um, basically, there's three modes that you're dealing with whenever you have a text box. Uh, so the mode that I would recommend is this middle one right here, which is auto height. Uh, so as you type in text, it's going to be dependent on that width and that text will wrap. So basically, you're setting a given width and that will allow your text to wrap. So be mindful of the text mode that you're working with. So auto width is just going to put it all on one line. I'm going to hit undo there. And the auto height is the one that you want to deal with. Uh, fun fact, there is a fixed size. And if you option click on fixed size, you will get ellipses. So I'll show you that one more time. If I do fixed size with my text, I come over here and I option click, then it'll actually give me ellipses and crop out the text from the, the field. So there are different options, yes, in working with text to make that better. And I'm glad, Jenny, that you love the truncate setting. I myself love the truncate setting, and I know that we got it uh, last config. So I'm really excited to see uh, this year what kind of new features we get at config. Um, cool. So, I mean, that's what we have for today. We would love your feedback. Uh, please let us know how we're doing. Your feedback is what powers future workshops and help us be much more effective at delivering the content and seeing what kind of content that you want. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for joining. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here today um, and uh, be on the lookout for future content. 